There we go. Hello, welcome everybody, and most importantly, welcome Josu. Good to see you. Thank you very much, Eki. Good to see you too. Hey, very, very good to see you. Can you uh, level up your microphone a little bit? Sure. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. For everybody who has never met Josu or at least seen or experienced him, he's uh, one of the famous faces in the Mordic community. He is really okay. not only nerdy and super technical, but also very passionate, passionate mortician. He's been around for quite a while. He's very famous for his blog uh, called mortim.org, where you find very, very good uh, tutorials, mostly in the technical infrastructure area, which is uh, close to the topic that we have today. It's called build your own SAS Mordic. Fascinating stuff. I can't wait to hear what you're going to tell us, but for everybody else, um, let me first introduce you properly. Um, as a long-term mortician and even longer IT person, you have the combination of infrastructure and DevOps with Mordic. And uh, that's a rare but very valuable skill set, I think. Uh, professionally, you do the interesting cases uh, maybe some others as well, I don't know, but you, you are um, most keen to, to get the challenges, the, the dev, but, but also infrastructure challenges. Uh, you also do consulting and strategy, of course, and even deliver training. Uh, feel free to tell us more about that, but I'd invite all our viewers and listeners to ask questions at any time. Uh, we have this Q&A slides like we always have and we have a link to it in Vietli. So please, when, when you have a question, type it right there right away and we'll have a lot of time afterwards to answer everything. Uh, well, I hope I didn't forget anything important. Anything from your side, Joseph, before we start? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, then uh, the stage is all yours. Thanks. Okay, See you later. Thanks. Well, well okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Josuke Dila and uh, welcome to Build Your Own Mautic SaaS. Um, first things first, uh, thank you for choosing this presentation. Uh, good afternoon to the Americans, good night already to the Europeans and for the Asians and the Australians. I, I hope that your brewing machine has not yet broken and if so, I will include an affiliate link for an awesome uh, <laughs> coffee brewing machine. Uh, I hope you have all enjoyed all the talks that we had here today. Uh, there are a few more still, so let's get started. <coughs> so before uh, we go deep into the materials, I want to give a big thanks to all the members of the Mauticon group um, who worked tirelessly against the clock to have these events ready and with very good uh, results. So why are we all here uh, today? We are here because marketing automation is damn expensive and we want to do something about it. And the good thing is that Mautic is free. Mautic is free as in free beer, which means that you don't have to pay for the licenses and Mautic is also free as in freedom, which means that you can have access to the code. Um, you can extend it, which means that if Mautic is doing something great for you, for your company, uh, you can improve upon it and make it even better. Uh, you can modify it, which means that if Mautic is doing something great for you, but you, it's not doing it exactly the way you want, you can modify it and make it do it the way you want. You can package it and distribute it, and you can even sell it. Uh, but the best of all, or the more important thing is that you can clone it a thousand times. How amazing is that? Um, but Yosu, the open source licenses have restrictions that apply to selling the software. Well, yeah, many, there are many types of uh, free and open source licenses. Some, <clears throat> sorry, are more restricted than others. Mautic is licensed under the GPL license, which is one of the less restrictive in existence which also means that uh, you can clone Mautic multiple times and you can sell it uh, on a CD or you can just distribute it over the internet. And the cost of the licenses will remain the same, which is zero. And let me be very, very clear what, about one thing. 
I always wanted to use this mimimus light and that's precisely what I did. So this talk is about building your own infrastructure, um, running thousands of Mautic instances, or maybe just a few dozen, maybe a hundred, and about automating all the required processes to be able to run this in a cost-effective and practical way. My name is Josu Kadila. I work mostly on large-scale Mautic um, deployments, which means uh, single instances of Mautic that run into the millions of contacts, uh, but also it means uh, in, uh, Mautic deployments that run many, many uh, smaller Mautics, which is what we use for SaaS. Uh, I also work on special case Mautic uh, projects, which means that even if you don't have a huge uh, project, uh, but you have an interesting project, I will be uh, very much uh, enticed to work with it if you, if you give me the chance. <coughs> so, basically I work in infrastructure and development, and I will, if I work uh, with you, if you um, for those large projects, then I will also do anything else that's related to Mautic, like Mautic consulting, uh, strategy, you name it. And as I like said, you can find me on the on the blog. Okay, so let's see the very basics the, uh, of how would you um, go about running your own uh, SaaS Mautic, and the basics are. Very basic and very simple. So basically, you need some kind of mechanism to route uh, all the incoming uh, requests for different domains, uh, which would be the, your different clients. And then you need a way to run the Mautic instances. Um, as you can see here in this illustration, uh, we, the, uh, we have a bastion, which is just one node, one server, one BPS. Uh, in our case, it's specifically one container. And we use HAProxy to, to manage this. Uh, HAProxy will not only root, we take also uh, care about the security. That's why we call it a bastion instead of just a router. And we'll also take care of uh, terminating the SSL connections. So basically that will route to the right uh, Mautic instance. And in our case, um, we run um, each database on its own container, and that's because then it's more portable, more secure, um, it helps uh, when we need to move um, nodes or instances from one host to another, from one cloud to another, whatever. And everything after the bastion is going to be happening in a private network. So this is the basic structure. Uh, everything, everything else is built upon this. Um, and this is how it looks on a different, let's say, view. Um, we have the big, let me just enable the pointer. We have our big, you know, host, VPS, dedicated server, whatever you, we are using. And this is a little bit um, of a view of uh, the network also, or how the access is managed. So first the clients would access um, through the public IP and get to our proxy device. So this would be HA, HA, sorry, uh, to our HA proxy uh, container, and then it would be routed internally on the internal network. And you see a piece of blue here, because after it reaches LexD, there's a proxy device that connects to the container. That could, that's very similar to what's, um, uh, oh, sorry, forgot. It's a routing device. And then uh, you have here the, um, this other color, which would be the internal uh, access to the MySQL containers to the databases, which means that you never have uh, a direct way to access from the external to the, uh, to, to, to the database containers, to the MySQL databases. Uh, this, each container can only be accessed from its specific um, Mautic container. So there's no other way other than going from the Mautic container to the MySQL database. And there's a change of uh, network happening just right here in this bridge. This is the same, uh, this is another view of exactly the same, uh, which means that uh, the, all this is happening on the public network. Here is the bridge 
when we have um, the, Lex, the proxy device in, uh, in LexD um, receiving from the external network, the one, and converting into internal IPs. And then we have this other, this is not a really a network bridge. Uh, I just want to, I would just like to differentiate that this is a different, it's not accessible except from the mounting container. And this is, this is again exactly the same, uh, just with some more explanations about how we manage security for, for these cases. <coughs> And now I'm, I'm want, I go back to the previous slide, and just is, this is just so I can click and show you again how that this would, would uh, look with the cluster. So when we build a cluster, uh, you can see that now we have three nodes. The public IPs are never used uh, except on, on one of the nodes. It, does, it, it can be any, any single one. Um, and then all the communication, usually we are using what's called a fan network for performance, but you can use any single way of doing this, and, and the traffic will come to the uh, to the HA proxy container, and then it will be routed to the proper node where the container actually lives. Um, that's it. Uh, when uh, then, if we want to take this one step further, we can then uh, use an HA implement implementation, which means that uh, in the previous example, uh, this was used only for hosting more. Mautic. So we have here Mautic 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, 6, uh, but we can also do it in another way, which is 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, which means that uh, if any one single node fails, we still have um, two other uh, net um, uh, copies of Mautic running, and this is also implemented uh, with um, the HA proxy. But instead of using it as a proxy that we were using it before, we can now use it as a load balancer, and then we use uh, keep alive. So uh, we use keep alive uh, in the middle just to make sure that uh, the HE proxy knows uh, which one node is the node in charge for the load balancing. Um, optionally, uh, you can also do the same uh, with the databases. So you would be using here a multi-master database, which means that um, no matter which n uh, node you are writing to, you will have a, the contents of the database replicated to the other nodes. Uh, that's also made in, in a con at a container level. And well, only special point for that is if you can uh, get a dedicated device for for joining uh, your nodes in the network. So get get this. this uh, all this happening in in those two red lines and and this one of the keep alive. In fact, um, I drown it in this way just for visual purposes, but everything is going to go through this route over here. So it, go, it will go through the cluster IP, uh, that's a private IP range. So how many clients can this uh, support? Well, 500 million, What's, what about 500 million uh, contacts? in many, many instances. Um, why do I say that? Because there's one uh, specific uh, deployment that does that, and uh, I know that because uh, the, the CTO of the company Digital Media Solutions is Head Dutton, which is a contributor, uh, large, long time contributor, long before I was there, uh, contributor to Mauric. And you can find in GitHub their repositories. And I mentioned this company be for, first because this huge uh, Mautic deployment, which, which currently has over 500 million contacts in it, uh, but also because they have contributed a completely different way that what I'm going to show you today. Um, com mm, based uh, almost entirely on Amazon Web Services, uh, or heavily based on Amazon Web Services, and it's very interesting to see it, and you, if you go to GitHub, you will see not only the code, but the explanation. It's a little bit outdated. I don't know if they are currently using this same version. I invite you to check it out to just compare the differences and see that it can be done in many ways. So building blocks that uh, technologies that we are uh, using for, for building this, or better said, the different, different possibilities that you have, uh, that you can choose from, when deciding to build something like this. 
And here is like a little uh, map of it. And this represents maybe one third of what's available out there. So basically, this is just three of each. Uh, for example, you know, there's no, not three cloud computing companies. There's hundreds of them. And there's no uh, just a few uh, databases there. That's also dozens. So this is uh, like a small representation of what I think it's or very important or very known or very useful uh, by my own standards. So uh, from the different cloud providers, um, I'm going to, I've been recommending DigitalOcean for a long time and I'm going not to recommend it anymore because I've uh, been suffering from, you know, weird behaviors on, specifically on the storage part uh, where some of the New York, New York 3, for example, had strong issues, uh, performance issues on the, on the drives and because for CFS, which is what runs uh, un underneath uh, LexD, which is what I use. It's very important to have fast uh, drives. Uh, I, don't, I cannot recommend it anymore. So we are left with uh, Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud, which uh, of the both I would recommend Amazon Web Services, but mostly because uh, it's the, what most people like to use. But Google Cloud is as uh, a little bit more performant, a little bit cheaper, and almost as good depending on what you want to do with it. So Amazon Web Services just has plenty more services. So on the, oops, let me go back. So for the databases, um, we have the original MySQL, uh, which many people uh, don't like to use because it's Oracle. Uh, it's still open source, but it's Oracle and it's Evil, but uh, I think it's a, an implementation that goes uh, one step, uh, forward from the others. So the others are basically uh, drinking from what MySQL does. So sometimes it will be better to use MySQL. Percona probably is and has been very strong, uh, the number one um, enterprise database, MySQL database or MySQL compatible database. And for that, it deserves, it deserves a special position in this uh, map. Uh, however, the advantage that they had was with ExtraDB or InnoDB performance, which MariaDB has just matched for in, in most cases. Uh, I wouldn't, I'm not sure if I could say overpass, but it's comparable. And because uh, MariaDB is what is recommended uh, or have been using for the most time in, in, in Mautic, it's going to be uh, my choice. So now we have the, the the PHP interpreters, and there's a very, very, very good um, hip hop virtual machine, which is uh, this interpreter here, which is very interesting. But it, it's 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 uh, it goes a little bit away from the main standards, and for that it can bring you a lot of trouble. So for that reason, I'm going to discard it. And then there's the uh, new newish or more newest PPM, which is several times faster than FPM. However, it's, uh, it seems not to be ready for production, or at least that's the general opinion. So I am planning on moving towards PPM, but for now, uh, my, cho my, uh, per my uh, selection would be uh, FPM and steel. So now we get to the containers, and the containers we have uh, four instead of three, uh, just because I would never use ContainerD, but uh, it's very popular, so I couldn't not, use, not add it here, and Rocket is also kind of the same. The Rocket is very focused on microservices, so maybe not the, the best thing for, for Mauric. And then we have like the, the real contenders, which, I, which are Docker and Lexi. And there's really not, no, no contest here. Docker is has a bigger uh, community, has a bigger, bigger documentation, has tons of tooling, and it's all the hype. Uh, Lexi on the other side is a small-ish uh, uh, community, a, a smaller, uh, older product, and basically um, Lexi is the father of Docker. So Docker was started uh, from a Lexi container and then evolved into its own thing. Here's the thing with Docker and Lexi. Docker is meant to be a volatile 
container where Lexi is supposed to be a permanent container. So Docker containers are designed to be um, created and destroyed and then rebuilt, which is not the best paradigm for something uh, monolithic and something that's meant to run on forever. Uh, Lexi on the other side is a system container, which means that it has everything that a regular, a regular VPS uh, based on KVM or other, on other similar technologies would have is just much lighter and much faster. Um, so for that, um, also because my personal um, way of doing things, you Docker containers, you program them, you build them with code, while Lexi containers, you, you launch them and then you implement whatever you need inside. That's something I'm more used to, more familiar, and I like a lot more. Um, so we, for all those reasons, uh, for me personally, and uh, we had, uh, or about to have, I think, or we had a wonderful presentation about how to use Docker containers for Mautic. And I think it was in Brazilian anyway, but uh, I mean, it's not just the absolute truth, it's just what I like to use for those reasons that I explain. And now we get uh, to, to the um, container managers or orchestrators. And I put here uh, Docker Swarm just because it's the, you know, same company that builds Docker, that created Docker Swarm. But since even Docker has admitted that Kubernetes does a better job than Swarm itself uh, for managing Docker containers, I'm just going to not use it. Uh, and then the kind of the real contenders is Kubernetes and, and LexD. And here we have a very similar problem or you know discussion that we had with uh, Docker and LexD. We have with Kubernetes and LexD. And the thing is that Kubernetes is huge and it's meant to manage thousands of containers, thousands even of nodes, um, ex except with very extreme cases, that's not what we do with, with Mauric. What we do is uh, manage a few dozen uh, different Mautic instances and <clears throat> sorry, the primitives that Lexi uh, give, uh, Lexi gives you for that are plenty enough. Lexi also has a, a very rich API that allows you to do anything that you can do on the console via the API. Yes, you can do that with Kubernetes. Just, just you can do exactly the same with Docker that you can do with Lexi and vice versa. They are, in fact, uh, so similar. Uh, that you can do the same. Is the, the philosophy and how you do those things that changes. This, a little bit of the same happens with Kubernetes and, and LexD. Kubernetes is more complex and has more features that, Lex, that LexD lacks, especially the part of uh, self-healing and the part of the elasticity. Um, if you are running Mautic machines for clients, Mautic instances for clients, you probably are not going to need elasticity. It's a good thing to have, but it's not something that you need to uh, dedicate a lot of resources in order to accomplish that, because probably that's not what your clients are asking from you, because you are running, you know, 10,000 10, uh, uh, contacts, 20,000 contacts, 50,000 contacts in each uh, of those instances, and elasticity is not one of the requirements. Um, the other big uh, difference would be the self-healing. Self-healing is very useful when you have applications that can die and be reborn. Then, I mean, if you have a microservices architecture and you have that, it's only uh, stupid not to use Kubernetes and not to use this method. But again, this is not what we have on uh, when we when we are deploying Mautic, and for that, and because I use Lexi, I prefer to use to use also Lexd. Uh, nowadays, you can run Lexi containers in Kubernetes, and uh, we just saw in in, uh, in another presentation Ruth talking about the future of Mautic and Mautic four, and I didn't see nothing specific about um, about the uh, a microservices architecture or the dream that we had uh, with, uh, with using a serverless architecture. But if I have any say, if I can participate in those groups or tigers or whatever, um, I will be trying to be pushing that. And at that time, most probably yes, 
Kubernetes is going to be this, the right solution. For now, I, I'm still uh, working with Legacy and I think I will be for a long time. So here below, we have other ways of deploying uh, anything, nodes, uh, containers, everything. Some are, some are software, uh, some are based on, on Amazon Web Services. Um, because LexD can do everything in here, except launching uh, new servers, and I mean physical machines or VPS, new VPSs, I'm not going to use any one of them. And that's a little bit of a lie because I will be using uh, Puppet or Ansible for deploying the uh, a new set of servers on a new um, cloud provider, but that's it. And I don't think it's uh, that important to, to have it as part of the, of the ecosystem. So for that, I'm going to delete all of them. So for the operating system, and I'm getting short on time, but I'm going to go fast. Uh, we have very good uh, operating systems. Debian probably one of the best. CentOS has been forever uh, running uh, web applications since forever. So they are very good. But because I'm using Lexi and LexD, uh, my preference is Ubuntu. Canonical is, uh, is the, uh, let's say, um, promoter and the company that's paying for the development in those in, in, behind LexD. They also have created many of other tools that I use. Um, so for that, I'm going to, to choose them. And then for the, oops, something didn't disappear. Okay, I'm reordering this and okay. So um, for the, and th it's an, another like kind of big deal um, for the HTTP um, servers. We have a ultra fast uh, light HTTP um, server. HTTP server um, has a little bit the same problems that you can find. Uh, this is quite not standard and not standard for mounting. It's a little bit dangerous, it's less known. The community is very nice, but it's not that big. Uh, so the real contain contenders here are Apache and Nginx. And that, if you, you can see the trend a little bit. So the people that usually are using uh, Docker and Kubernetes are going to be using Nginx. And the people that are using, you know, Lexi and LexD are probably going to be using Apache. Apache is older. Uh, many, many, many websites, pages, analysis, reports will say, will say that Nginx is faster. And that's just uh, half a true, half a reality. Uh, the reality is that it's much faster with static content, but if properly configured, Apache is just as fast or slightly faster than Nginx for PHP content. Um, why, no, why everybody is saying just the opposite is by, because Apache is very old and has a lot of um, older background to maintain and to keep uh, going forward, which means that the default installation of Apache is very, very simplistic and it's very not performant. It's just very compatible with everything else that goes behind, that goes behind it. Uh, Nginx instead will not simply not work with a set of configuration that's not much more modern and much and much faster. But if you can configure Apache. Um, uh, to the same level of, of, of uh, default Nginx installation, Apache will be slightly, uh, in theory, is, uh, we are talking really so small things that it's very hard to, to compare, except with your load specifically, and then you can see the difference. Okay, so for that, and because Apache supports HTT access files, which is something that we are using on, uh, on Mautic, I go through this route of Apache. Anyway, this, one of the reasons Apache is less performant than Nginx in most cases is because it uses the HTT access file. So what I do uh, is I uh, copy all the configuration that Mautic has. I kind of modify it a little bit, but I, I, the basic idea is you copy everything that you have in the HTT access file and you put it in the default Apache configuration and you get rid of the HTT access file, which is you, what, exactly what you would do if you are using Nginx and then you get a faster Apache. That's it. So then we have uh, Memcached uh, versus Redis. Redis is much popular. Redis does a ton of things. Redis can be used as a database. Redis can be used as so many things. Memcached on the other side 
is uh, less favored, much older, but for Mautic, it works, I think, slightly better. And because it doesn't do as many things as Redis, uh, it's more specialized on what we need with it, with his catching uh, very specific things for, for Mautic and, and MySQL. So for that reason, we, I go for, with Memcached. Um, I think the next one is uh, the, the email server. So you can use an, a local um, SMTP server. My recommendation is don't do that. Use the API or use some spool scripting that you can program yourself. It's quite simple. And there are plenty of examples. Then we have the uh, different um, proxies. Um, I'm using HA proxy currently. HA proxy, when I started using it, didn't even have an API, or yes, it had an API, but it was only for the paying customers. Uh, because of that, I started researching in other possible alternatives, and I found Envoy to be a very, very, very good uh, alternative to HA proxy. Um, however, during this time, HA proxy just released uh, with 1.9, I think. Um, the availability of the API for everyone. The API in the beginning was quite simple. Now it's much, much more complete. Uh, so for that, I still using HA proxy, but just because I'm used to it and it works very well for me, but I am already uh, researching into jumping into Envoy. And one of, one of the reasons is because even if we are not on Kubernetes, we might be on Kubernetes, but also because uh, we are researching into the possibility of using what's called a sidecar for each of the uh, different um, containers, which allows uh, with security and, and with internal routing and whatnot. So probably we might uh, jump here, but HA proxy is also catching up on this area, so I don't know. So for that, I'm going to recommend uh, Envoy, uh, but I'm going to be still using HA proxy. And then we have the queues. I just put, put here Binstar D because uh, Mautic already supports it out of the box. Um, really, I don't know much about it. The little bit I know, I don't perfectly like it. It's a kind of a foreign language uh, that it uses. So RabbitMQ is kind of the default thingy to go uh, when you want to use a queue for PHP. And because of that, uh, most people are going to be use it, uh, using RabbitMQ. And that's what I recommend to everybody. But I, I also will not uh, delete Kafka because Kafka is a, has a very different approach than RabbitMQ, uh, basically uh, storing streams of data into disk without using any RAM. RabbitMQ, on the other, ha on the other hand, is going to be uh, RAM intensive. And RAM intensive is exactly what we already have with Mautic, PHP, and MySQL, especially MySQL. So Kafka could be a better complement for very specific things, and especially specifically for uh, incoming data for from the tracking. Uh, and proxy SQL is just here because you're going to need something if you are going to do HA uh, and proxy SQL, which works fantastically with HA proxy, is the perfect tool for, for those situations. Okay, so that would be what it looks like. Uh, this is just what I use, what I recommend using in most of the cases. Uh, but as you can see, there are plenty of possibilities and plenty of other choices, and I recommend to... Uh, so I've been researching that for years, almost two years and a half, and choosing carefully each of the tools. So I think this is very close to... Uh, uh, from the performance perspective, it's a very close to perfect, but this is perfect for me. And if you happen to uh, know a tool, for example, if you happen to know, <coughs> to, uh, know a lot and use uh, Docker containers, it's probably better that you use Docker containers because uh, LexD, uh, sorry, Lexi and Docker are very similar. It's better to work with what you master than learning another technology because maybe you get a 1% extra performance. Um, so in most cases, it's better to just, just use what you already know. Okay, so um, I'm already four minutes. I'm going to spend maybe five more minutes. Sorry, everyone. Um, the thing is that when you have all this in place uh, and you start deploying containers, if you have to deploy, let's say, like one container a week, one new client a week, this is not a big deal and you can do it manually. But uh, usually 
the clients tend to deploy several uh, new clients a week, which starts uh, either uh, betting a heavy kind of heavyweight on the um, side of economics. So, for example, they have to pay me to deploy a new client, or um, on the other hand, it gets very complex uh, um, when the numbers grow big. So, for that, we have created a an API which we call mDeploy, and this API uh, tries to solve uh, deploying multi containers, multi instances with multi containers and, does, and database containers from a very, very, very simple API with very few commands that are kind of marketing understandable commands, like create new client, pause on pause client, things like that. So basically you can access from your application, from your SaaS, from a mobile application, whatever you have, you can send commands to the mDeploy API and from there it will take care of all the required steps uh, to to have a working um, multi deployment, multi instance, and also to manage it once it is deployed. Uh, right now, we we have we are working on version three, which will be released in a couple of weeks maybe. And we have this blue zone op uh, operative. We have uh, most of this green uh, operative. We don't have the continuity. We do have the monitoring, uh, and down here we have the Cloudflare. Um, bridge uh, implemented, which uh, but we do, and the Let's Encrypt um, certificate creation for each new uh, multi instance also solved. But this is, for example, a work in progress. Maybe it will be just an update for the for the third version that we are working now about the release now, or maybe it will be in the fourth. We don't know. Uh, the idea is that the all the, the time that it takes to configure a new um, says. Uh, Domain uh, would be um, will be solved just as, as you could solve also the cloud the, the the DNS portion of it, which is not solved. So we solved the bridging of the from Cloudflare, but we have not solved yet the and by solved I mean implemented uh, the capability of uh, managing the DNS yet. It's not complicated, so it's just uh, a lot of work to do all this. So we will get there pretty soon. And then we have the M panel, which is basically, uh, if you see here, uh, you can see that we have here the M panel is just the same as your your SaaS application or your or your um, uh, website where that you can sell Mautic there, and you and the customer fills the form, clicks a button, and two minutes after they receive an email, your Mautic instance is is ready. Well, we, another thing that you can plug into the into uh, M deploy API is the panel. The panel is very simple. Right now it's very bare bones. This is version 2, uh, 1.5, let's say, and we are going, we are releasing version 2 pretty soon, which is, uh, have a lot of, a lot more, not a lot more features. It has basically the same features plus a couple of new things, but it's much more beautiful or less ugly and kind of more intuitive. And here is where we are planning to go in the middle term, which is basically the same that you had before, but here we have a little bit more explain what, what we are uh, uh, working on right now, uh, which are the things that are not yet implemented. And then we are adding this layer of code management, um, which will uh, take care of, of the Mautic updates, which is something that now we still have to do uh, manually. So if you, uh, could wait for 2040 almost here. Thank you very much. And that's it for my presentation. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to respond. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, that, was, that was fantastic. That was really deep. Uh, and the, <laughs> the first learning for me is I finally know how to pronounce Lexi, I always, Lexi. <laughs> I always said LXT. And Lexi. Broke yes. my song. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Other than that, and then you have the, the the CFS. So this is ZFS, but you call it CFS, and it doesn't sound right for many people. Yeah. Yeah. So many things like that. Um, I have a couple of quick questions for you, and um, great. Let's start from the top, or, best, or, or rather from from bottom. Are M deploy and M panel public? 
No, they are not public and they are probably, I don't know, probably never going to be. That's what we make the money off. And it's yeah. a lot of money to develop. So that's uh, the nice thing about having this as a money source is that we can give away other things. So probably not, probably not. So, so it, uh, or at least not the same version. So okay. we might yeah. release something yeah. that's uh, very practical for small deployments mm -hmm. because we think that our customer base is going to have maybe larger deployments. And yeah. so we uh, we are not afraid that it will eat into the income, but and then we can share it more. But uh, for now, we are working with a lot of smaller, small deployments. Oh. There is not a huge market. Yeah, not yet. Anyway. <laughs> yes, <laughs> not yet and yeah. probably never. Then yeah. next coming from flow, it's uh, can you talk about security components? Yeah, sure. What exactly uh, can he? So, okay, I, I explained the basic, the basic. Okay, let me, can I go back to the sure. slide or is it? Sure. Yeah. How do, how do I do that? <laughs> okay. So let me just try to go to, I don't know where. Probably here. So here you can see a little bit how this is built. So you have the public network. That and this line here would be the the uh, let's say the Perimeter? the firewall on yeah. your on your machine. But even then, no, the, the firewall would be here. In fact, so you would that would be still the same network. But then in the proxy, so, okay, how do we go that, uh, about that? So LexD is going to live in your, on top of your host, on top of your operating system. And any, every container will plug directly into the kernel. Uh, this means that for separation, one of the biggest tools that you have is the networking. And be, having a, a completely separated network will not allow any, any incoming traffic to map into the local network. Okay, that's that's the basic idea. Then, of course, here in the cloud provider, you already have a firewall, which you can limit to whatever ports you are using. No, uh, for, you can limit uh, access to ports 80 and 443 only, but this will also be open to all possible IPs, otherwise it's useless. But you can uh, limit your, your LexD controller or your M is the old name for the, for the M deploy and your SSH to certain IPs. So that's a, uh, one little layer here, and then uh, when you when the traffic reaches your host, uh, there's nothing in the host. Only LexD lives in the host. Not even not even the proxy lives in the host. The proxy lives in a container. So everything has to pass through um, IP tables, which is what I forgot to the name a moment uh, minutes ago. IP tables, but uh, instead of using IP tables in LexD, we have what's called a proxy device, which makes the function of IP tables, but, but is, it has much less capabilities, it's much less, less complex, it has less room for, uh, uh, for human error, and it has less uh, uh, room for hacking. So basically, you have a bridge here, and only whatever you decide that has access will go forward. For example, we only SSH to the host, but we don't LXD proxy device to the containers port 22. So if, if I want to manage container number three, I have to log in to the, uh, to the port 22 on the host, and from the host, I, I can then access the container. So one less thing to worry about. Another thing we have open is the specific LX, L, uh, LXD API port which also also terminates here in the host and you cannot access any of the Lexi LexD components inside the containers. Again, in the host, you can again close everything that you don't want to use. And then again in, again in the containers, you can close everything that you, want, that you don't want to use, which means that not only it's impossible to access uh, the database container from the outside network, but also you can only use 3306 to access this container, but this port is closed in the cloud provider, in the host, and in the, in the multi-container. So it's very, very hard to get to, to this data unless you do really a lot of jumps. And if you can see here, uh, Lexi and Lexd is implemented in a way that if you, gain, if you happen to gain uh, root access 
in the host, you are nobody uh, in the container. And nobody is not just nobody. It's, it's, it's a technical name for you have no rights in this container, in this VPS. Uh, and the same and the same happens otherwise. If you gain uh, access to one of the containers, be maybe root, maybe any other um, user, you have no access, no privileges in any other container and or in the host. Um, so I consider it to be pretty secure. I don't know if that's all you wanted to know. If you want to know more about security inside Apache, this is a this is a completely other topic and. It's even much longer. This is very simple, in fact. I mean, it's ports and, and, and networks. It's relatively simple. If you want to start uh, dealing with uh, Apache security or, I mean, HA proxy, HA proxy, the bastion, is called a bastion for one reason. is because it's extremely reliable. So everything that go, reaches the host Will go. Will get plugged first into the bastion, which is an extremely secure way of accepting uh, HTTP traffic and HTTPS traffic, and then gets routed to the container. So I think it's very, very solid. And again, if you have a cluster, you will not be using the the, the public IP. So the public IP is only going to be accessible on one of the nodes, and in the rest of the nodes, it's not going to be used. You can even. I mean, you cannot close it because this. Uh, other network is virtual, but you know it's relatively secure uh, to use it this way. No traffic is going to be come here for pub from public uh, IPs, and here it will be very limited. I uh, could talk for hours. Hope this is enough. Let me. I don't know how to close this now and get back to the presentation. Okay. Yeah, uh, we only have like like two or three minutes left. Uh, I have two okay. simple questions for you here. Uh, one is from Ryan. That is, that is, what do you recommend for GDPR aware users? Still, Amazon? Yeah. Or what about Azure? The, uh, I don't think there's any difference from my from my perspective because I'm dealing with hardware networking and containers or VPSs and Mautic instances, not with the how Mautic treats the data which is a, comp a completely different matter, and I don't deal with it. So, and then also Azure, Google Cloud, Amazon Web Services, I don't care. I mean, this is just infrastructure and some services. So yeah, maybe some services, specific services, like I don't know, Amazon Cognito, uh, deal with, in a better way that maybe the, the equivalent service in, in Azure. I really don't know. I really don't mm. care because it's not my job. Okay. But one. I don't think there's a different. There's an intrinsic difference related to GDPR on the cloud provider you use. Maybe on the specific services you can buy from them. Maybe yes. Yeah. But otherwise, I don't see a difference. Yeah, they talk about server locations. Both, of course. It's, it's also yeah, of course. Yes. But, but okay. Here's one from Barco. Uh, does running HA with more Mordic cluster not triple the cost of running Mordic? I run a non-clustered environment with LCD HA proxy. Are you running this on dedicated? Well, wait, 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 a little uh, slower again. Can I see the question? No, I can't. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Second. Share screen. Don't tap. Slides. There you go. Okay, those running HI with a Mautic cluster. Okay, there's no such a thing as a Mautic cluster. There's a cluster where you deploy Mautic, okay? So I, I probably you know that, but just for the audience, um, not triple the cost of running Mautic. Oh yeah, sure. So yes and no, but the basic, the basic answer is yes. If you are running one Mautic for each client, you have one cost. If you are running two in HA or three in HA or 20 in HA, you are 20 times more secure or even or even 200 times more secure because the uh, the availability increases much further, but then you, you are multiplying the cost. With an exception or a, or a little note there, you don't have to be, with containers, you don't have to be running all the containers all the time. And that's even even more true with Docker maybe 
because it's a little bit faster in launching. So you can launch, so you have a stopped container, a uh, Lexi container. It might take something from zero, so 0 0.5 seconds to two seconds to launch. Probably you can scratch like uh, 200 milliseconds of that with, with, with Docker. So you, what, one thing you can have if, if, if you are very concerned about the overall cost is you have three copies of each Mautic, if, each single client, but you are running one and those are like uh, on standby. In the moment that this one dies, then you can in you know half a second pull one one another. Or if that's not enough because you don't want one specific client you know having to wait half a second, you could have the two copies uh, running, and the third and the fourth and the fifth could be just in standby. So when one of one dies, you still have the second full time working, and then you start another full time, and and in the meantime you repair the first one or you kill it or whatever you have to do. Yeah. Oh, it's too bad. We have more questions, but we gotta okay. wrap this up because we're running out of time. So okay, I can go fast. I mean, we have like ten minutes, right? Or no? Uh, or you no. don't have ten minutes? Oh, okay. Huh? Yeah. Next. Okay. Next, uh, okay. Yeah, I understand. Okay, yes. I, I give you one. Thank more. you very much. Hang on, I okay. give you one more quick one. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Beyond Pack, how do you organize deployment, e.g., of Mautic updates, but also configuration changes? So this is not an infrastructure question now maybe it's not a quick one. no and yes so uh, it's not but it affects us so configuration is something that's not should or i don't know depending how you look at it so basically uh, not infrastructure question but yes we need to deal with it and there's two res two responses one we deal with manually and second one is as i showed you in the uh almost the one previous to the last uh, uh, slide, we are working on it, on it on a specific engine to take care of updates. Uh, actually, right now we do it, we do it uh, uh, semi-manually. So we have a file server, uh, which is another uh, Lexi container, which contains all the files, all the versions of the files that we can, like configuration files, not, mm -hmm. uh, not PHP files yet. So basically, uh, when we have to, ha to change the configuration, instead of going in and manually changing the configuration, we just call the latest file so we don't make any mistakes when editing manually. So the, the file is there. We, if we do changes, we have kind of a repository of files and, and with versions, so we know which one to put in some places. But it's kind of not automated, and that's what we are looking forward to do. Okay, look. So let's wrap <laughs> it up. Thank you so much uh, for your time. And uh, thank you. I know it's late over in in. Uh, where are we? In, 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 yeah, it's uh, nine, about nine. Uh, okay. Anyways, it's been a long day. We have a couple of more uh, yes. tracks uh, which, and, and sessions ahead of us. And um, yes, it was fun so far. Thank you so much. Uh, and I talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. See you soon. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Cheers.